Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. In part one of our series on the Faceless Men, we discussed the founding of Bravos and the House of Black and White. Specifically, why we believe that a member of a race of children who lived amongst the slaves in the Valyrian mines was the first faceless man and gave the first of many gifts to the many-faced god. We also discussed how the slaves who founded Bravos were led there by the moon singers, who to this day have the greatest temple in all of Bravos. We also briefly touched on how the Moon Singers were part of a larger group called the Jogos Nai, that we believe are yet another race of children, indigenous to the easternmost parts of Essos. The Jogos Nai, like their Westerosi counterparts, are small, have oddly shaped skulls, and are known for continuously warring against their neighbors. Together, the children native to Valyria and the enslaved moon singers of the Jogos Nai orchestrated a mutiny on the slave ships bound for Sothorios and planted the seeds of their revenge in a secret city which is now known as Bravos. We concluded by referencing our theory that it was a race of children who caused the doom of Valyria with the hammer of the waters, the same way they broke the arm of Dorne and finished by reading the passage from A Feast for Crows, where the kindly man tells Arya that the first faceless man gave the gift of death to the Valyrian dragon lords. An author's annotation placed on this statement in the iBook version of A Feast for Crows drew even more attention to his words, stating that it, quote, appears the kindly man is hinting at yet another explanation for the doom of Valyria. In part two, we will begin with Arya's journey to Bravos, what she encounters when she arrives, and why we believe that the cavernous vaults of the House of Black and White are home to yet another gate to the underworld. So, let's do this. So, Arya secures passage to Bravos by showing the captain the iron coin given to her by Jock and Hagar. As they sail across the narrow sea, many of the people aboard the Titan's daughter begin showering her with gifts and repeatedly telling her their names. We later find out that this is because one of the rules of the House of Black and White and the Faceless Men is that they cannot kill someone that they know. When approaching Bravos, all the stars seem to vanish, with the exception of two golden ones, which the captain's son tells her are no stars at all, but the eyes of the Titan. This seems to parallel the two huge golden eyes that John sees north of the wall, which, to us, appears to be a symbol that George uses to signify that John and Arya had entered enemy territory as golden eyes tend to be a trait found in species that prowl the night. Arya then recalled the story Old Nan used to tell about the Titan of Bravos. Old Nan said that he was a giant as tall as a mountain who protected the people of Bravos from enemies and was known to feed on the juicy pink flesh of highborn girls. Now, of course, Maester Lewin went in and told the children that Old Nan's stories are just that. Stories. But, as Old Nan seems to be batting a thousand when it comes to these sorts of things, it seems to be a bad time to start doubting her. Even Mira seems to think that Bran should take care to remember what Old Nan taught him when she told him to... Remember Old Nan's stories, Bran. Remember the way she told them the sound of her voice. Once in the lagoon, Denyo, the captain's son, tells Arya about the moon singers and some of the other gods worshipped in Bravos. 
As they get closer, the captain has another of his sons take Arya to the House of Black and White. They come upon the Isle of Gods, where she sees the Temple of the Moon Singers, a red stone edifice where the worshippers of R'hllor honor the Lord of Light, and lastly, to where the old forgotten gods are worshipped. After saying Valar Margulis, and possibly showing the face on the door the iron coin, the doors of the House of Black and White magically open, and slam closed behind her after she entered. The darkness is initially blinding, but she could hear the sound of running water. After her eyes adjust, she takes note of the fact that the temple seems to be much larger than it had from the outside, which we believe is significant because that, coupled with the ever-present sound of running water, are two observations that she makes that draw additional parallels between the House of Black and White and the cave that Bloodraven and Bran are in north of the Wall. Arya notices that the air is heavy and warm, and filled with unfamiliar smells, which she puts down to some queer incense. But as she gets deeper into the temple, the smells become familiar, reminding her of Winterfell and of home. This is remarkably similar to what happens to Bran when he eats the weirwood paste Leaf tells him will, quote, awaken his gifts and wed him to the trees. Initially, Bran thinks it tastes bitter and hard to get down, but by the third bite, he can't even remember why he had ever thought it was bitter. The tastes become those of honey, of new-fallen snow, of cinnamon, and the last kiss his mother ever gave him. And he finds himself lapping it up eagerly. It would appear that the magic both Bran and Arya are being manipulated by reacts to each individual in a manner which is pleasing to them, so that they would feel more comfortable and let their guards down. The creepy part is that the magic seems to know what you like and changes to become familiar and pleasing, and by extension, comforting. Now, before we move forward, I'm going to take a brief moment to point out that the House of Black and White has a weirwood door as well as weirwood chairs in the room in which the faceless men determine who will give which gifts. If the many-faced god is in fact the religion that the founders of Bravos developed, then it seems that the House of Black and White existed long before Bravos became a trading port. Bravos was a secret city, hiding under the fogs of the lagoon, unbeknownst to the entire world. So it seems clear that they weren't trading with anyone, let alone with people from Westeros, as their secret city would have very quickly become known. Nonetheless, the founders of Bravos, and by extension the followers of the Many-Faced God, built the House of Black and White with materials that included weirwood. This is important because it is said that weirwoods only exist in Westeros, so how would slaves from Essos be aware that weirwoods even existed? Secondly, how would they know what it is capable of? And most importantly, where they could find one? This leads us to one of three conclusions. There is either a weirwood in Bravos, near Bravos, or both. Despite being a city founded on religious tolerance and acceptance of all gods, there are no weirwoods in Bravos, at least not any in plain sight. Being that the weirwood is considered a god, and the city is a place that claims to be one in which all gods are worshipped, it seems that there should at the very least be a small godswood somewhere in Bravos, but there isn't. Well, we believe the answer to this conundrum lies in the House of Black and White. In the center of the black and white doors of the temple, there is a carved moon-shaped face which Arya thinks is watching her, just like the weirwood used to in Winterfell. After her sense of smell is manipulated, Arya notes that she has more courage, courage enough to put away Needle. As another quick aside, this is another creepy thing that occurs. 
as the purpose of it seems to be to ensure that those who come and seek of the gift of death have the courage to follow through with it. Anyways, she comes upon a black pool. Now, the only other black pool in the story is in front of the Weirwood at Winterfell. Since we know that Weirwoods can grow underground, i.e. the one at Casterly Rock and the Black Gate, this leads us to believe that there is a Weirwood deep below the earth, in the deepest levels below the House of Black and White. It is our belief that the many-faced god is what the founders of Bravos named their new religion. This subtle variation in name seems to be designed to distract from the fact that they are really worshipping the weirwood trees, which, after all, are trees with many faces. This should not be confused with the old gods worshipped by the first men, as these were the innumerable gods of earth, gods of life, and therefore stand in stark contrast to the many-faced god. On one side, you have a god, singular, with many faces. On the other, gods, plural, with no faces. As Melisandre said, everywhere, opposites, everywhere, the war. Another parallel between the faceless men and the weirwoods is the way that the trees seem to take on the likeness of the last greenseer who looked through its eyes. For example, in A Dance with Dragons, Theon goes to the godswood in Winterfell and notices that the weirwood looks like Bran, who was the last greenseer to gaze through that particular tree's eyes. Another example of this can be found in the prologue of A Dance with Dragons, when Varamir Sixkins inadvertently enters the weirwood when frantically attempting to skin change into anything he could before he died. From the tree, he watches the slaughtered wildlings rise again as whites, and Thistle, the wildling woman he tried to skin change into, looks over at the tree, and Varamir thinks, Ooh, she sees me. This indicates that when Thistle looked at the tree, it had taken the facial features of Varamir, making it possible for her to recognize it as him. The kindly man tells Arya that mummers change their faces with artifice, and sorcerers use glamours, weaving light and shadow and desire to make illusions that trick the eye. He says that these arts she too shall learn, but what they do at the House of Black and White goes deeper. Right before Arya becomes the ugly little girl, the kindly man gives her a potion to drink, which parallels Bran's consumption of the weirwood paste that helps awaken his gifts and wed him to the tree. We believe these are the same substances in different forms and are necessary for a skin changer to consume in order to skin change into something that is dead, as opposed to the skin changing they naturally do with living creatures. In the House of Black and White, they truly change their skin taking a new face and in turn looking exactly like someone else. But there is a lot more to the version of skin changing practiced by the faceless men. When they take a new face, they truly become that person, with their personality, voice, memories, likes and dislikes, allowing them to take someone else's place. Such as was the case with Jaka Nagar when he took over Pate's role at the Citadel. Looking like Pate might have gained him entrance, but he is still there impersonating Pate right up to the end of the story. Without the ability to summon Pate's memories, likes, and dislikes, it would be impossible that no one noticed the marked differences between the real Pate and Jockin over such a long period of time. This is further illustrated by Arya's first face-changing experience, where the memories of the girl she became came flooding in, almost overwhelming her, and driving her into a panic. When Arya is almost to Bravos, she thinks to herself that she never seems to find the places she sets out to reach. 
The kindly man tells Arya that the many-faced god led her to the house of black and white so that she may be his instrument. This is similar to the way the crow manipulated both Bran and Jojen in order to get them to the cave beyond the wall. But for what purpose? Well, according to the kindly man, all gods have their instruments, men and women who serve and help work their will on earth. The faceless men are clearly instruments of death, so it seems that Bran and Arya have been strategically lured to these locations to ensure that their powers cannot be used by mankind in the coming battle, but by him of many faces. All men must die, right? That is, unless they can somehow manage to find their ways out of the darkness. Speaking of darkness, we want to end by sharing a tale from Norvos, one of the nine free cities, that reveals yet another sinister link between the cave and the house of black and white. One cavern system, some hundred leagues northwest of Norvos, is so vast and so deep that legend claims it is the entrance to the underworld.